The public is extremely interested in the subject, yet there's little news coverage. The government has been silent but also contradictory on this topic. This UAP phenomenon appears to some people and not others. So they're contradictions. But that's why one of the reasons that I'm super interested in Science 2.0, I have each as they call it, and try to resolve paradoxes to see what's underneath paradoxes. That's a place that'll move the needle for. Welcome to Merge. I'm Ryan Graves. Today, we're joined by Kurt and Jai Mungo. Kurt is a filmmaker with a background in mathematical physics from the University of Toronto. As the host of Theories of Everything podcast, Kurt dissects topics on theoretical physics, consciousness, God, free will, all the profound questions we tend to outwardly ignore, but inwardly wrestle with. Today, we explore how theories of everything, consciousness, and UAP three of Kurt's areas of interest relate or don't relate to each other. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Merge podcast. And now, Kurt Jamangle. Sadly, a large majority of this interview was lost to a technical issue. However, due to the magic of modern AI, we've been able to recover large portions of the audio. Although it is far below our personal standards, we elected to still air this episode, imperfections included. As the tools improve, we're hoping to be able to upload an improved version over time. Thanks for bearing with us. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Merge Podcast. Coyus Institute is a pioneer in the field of AI-driven comparative and qualitative analysis and was established with the primary goal of uncovering the hidden value left behind in complex data sets. Through a combination of human expertise and cutting-edge technologies, Coyus has developed a range of services that cater to various industries. They are providing valuable insights that can help drive growth formulate competitive strategy, and to identify key patterns in targeted demographics. Head to their site to learn more, Institute. That's C-O-E-U-S dot institute. Well, Kurt, thank you for joining me here today. Uh, you have your own podcast. Would you introduce us to, to what that podcast is and what you study on? Sure. So thanks, firstly, Ryan. It's great to meet you in person. The podcast is called Theories of Everything, and it's about physics and math and consciousness, but it's theories of everything from a theoretical physics perspective, but then also under understanding or trying to ascertain what the fundamental laws are, what does fundamental mean. We drew several scientists, primarily professors, and then I became intrigued by the UFO topic or UAP topic. Mm -hmm. By the way, what do you call it? UFOs or UAP? UAP. Uh, that's the nomenclature I use. and. The definition, uh, as of recently, has been updated to unidentified anomalous phenomenon. Uh, so the acronym remains the same, although the definition is slightly more uh, domain agnostic and could say. Right, right, right. Uh, and we've updated uh, within the uh, AIAA UAP Integration Outreach Committee. Uh, we util utilize uh, anomalous as our definition of UAP as well. So that's our working definition. So it includes submerged. It's domain agnostic. Uh, and knowledge anywhere. So very good. So you, you're looking really at kind of uh, our the unknown of science and where the direction we can take uh, our understanding to kind of combine uh, all our disparate theories, such as uh, you know uh, general relativity with perhaps the quantum world and and all these other areas. So what's what's your educational or professional background that led you onto that topic? I have a background in math and physics, mathematical physics. So. I've always been interested in theories of everything since I was a kid. Then when I left university, I went into filmmaking, but at the same, but I've always extremely interested in TOS, theories of everything, great case I use that acronyms, TOE. So then even in my films, there was elements of math and physics and a certain analytical mindset, logical basis that underlies math and physics into something creative. Then during the pandemic, I thought I saw several interviews of Donald Hoffman. Well, not so. I saw some interviews with Donald Hoffman. And he makes claims about consciousness and how it relates to physics. And people were asking him questions at a fairly superficial level, I found. And I thought, well, hey, if he's talking about, if he's saying that this is based in papers of math and physics, I can read those papers and ask him those questions specifically about the equations. So I did that and that became successful and I thought, okay, well, this is like banging out all of my cylinders, my filmmaking skills, my analytical mindset, my interest, my heavy, almost my obsessive interest to tools and to theories of everything. So it's just a 
a blessing that it's taken off. But do you see, you know, these three kind of regimes that you talk about, theories of everything, consciousness, and now UAP to some degree, uh, at least on the first two, uh, do you feel they're directly related? You can have one without the other, or do you typically consciousness as part of theory of everything as we would understand it? So it's a treacherous question. <laughs> so, okay, hey, so what you're saying is there's the physics theories of everything, quantum mechanics, general relativity, how to put those two together. Which, by the way, that's the way that is explained to the public, but that's not always the way it could be driven to put for it out, let's just put it as a step. And then you say, okay, does consciousness fit in? And then if so, does UAPs fit in? Is that the question? Well, we can get to UAPs later, but uh, these, are the, these are the areas that you've been interfacing with on your podcast. So, you know, how do you tie them together for your storyline? The question is like, what is a theory of everything? So if this is season, as what are the fundamental laws such that every other phenomenon is some large scale limit of those laws? And hopefully it can be falsified. The theory can be falsified and provides new predictions then from a more philosophical perspective you're wondering well what is everything does that include consciousness does that include well everything what i'm interested in what is a thing as well what the heck is a thing forget about everything what is a thing so as carl first and jock valley also talks about that he and Miguel Prisler will both soft the site and then also what's the opposite of a thing what is nothing what is no thing it's a song it sounds a bit Eastern, but the Eastern concept of nothingness, quote unquote, is not a lack of. So it's, it's, it's extremely tricky. Um, I'm investigating from several perspectives, and I feel like we think that it's this, it's explained to the public like there's quantum field theory or the standard model, and it's like a jigsaw puzzle, and the, there's jet of general and so we're trying here, nope, doesn't fit. So we're trying over here, nope, doesn't fit. So maybe if it's from some other angle that we haven't tried, or maybe some multi-dimensional object subs that jits on a 2D. But then I'm also thinking, it, the more that I investigate this, the more I see that's like, perhaps it's not like these, this and this, they're adjacent. Perhaps in order, perhaps this this piece, this quantum mechanics piece, fits in with this one, which fits into that one, which fits into general relativity. Because we think we're just one step removed, and perhaps we're at three, four, five steps removed. Maybe consciousness fits into one of those. That's, that's an extremely controversial thing. But maybe it does. I'm not discounting that. Very good. Well, you know, obviously there's, maybe perhaps not obviously, I shouldn't use that word, but uh, there's been indications of, you know, conscious observer being fundamental to our understanding of quantum physics and how we interact with the universe. And now we're getting to a, a bit deeper understanding of perhaps uh, the non fundamental nature of space time itself and therefore the non fundamental nature of the particles and things of that nature in it. Uh, if you think about it from that perspective, is there room for for a qualia type definition of consciousness to be part of that equation, or do you think that's purely still a uh, a intelligence kind of based is uh, understanding of where we are in the universe? I might have got a little way away from it on the end of that question, but there these are that there there are Nobel Prize winning physicists who believe that consciousness has something to do with fundamental law, so that Enros does. does has something to do with the the collapse of the quantum wave function as not just headless but there's a role of physicist then there's the majority of this i think with sagan alt but that's about care too much about the majority at least so the answer is yes well if i understood the question correctly can you restate the question for what? so uh as we as we have a firmer understanding of the kind of non-local or not real nature of space-time, as we kind of further understand that space-time and the components of it may be uh, non-fundamental, uh, is there is there is that opening for uh, qualitative experience uh, be part of? Uh, I tell you what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just it's extremely tricky because in order to make some inference from a quality, some equality, which is not quantitative, if we're contrasting those two, to something quantitative, I don't know how to make that leap. I don't know how to make the leap from something quantitative to qualitative either. It's almost like the is and the ought. You've heard of that. And that's right. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I was just wondering where, you know, where, where could they potentially fit? Because I agree with you, if there is a theory of every, you know, everything, consciousness, you know, almost by definition has to be in there unless our definition of everything is limited to our understanding of space-time. 
uh, or you know, or those is statements, those those technical statements. So how do we how do we build that bridge? Is where we're at. Speaking of the, and have you seen any of those potential bridges through your understanding of you know your conversations that you've had with people about consciousness or people about theories of everything? I have intimated several of those bridges, whether or not it's explicit, I, I can't say it. I feel it, I intuit it. So, on Toll, there is something called Tomnanza, the end of the year 2022. What happened was, we have Matt O'Dowd, so someone from PBS Space Time, and then Richard Dolan and John Vervegi, cognitive scientist, along with Grant Cameron and, and uh, several other people who you would never think of, Motley Crew. It's like a golem offering. You would never see these people together. And then I was thinking, well, this is like this event that happens once a year for eight hours. But then I realized, you know, this happens every day in my head because I speak to these people. And I'm constantly relating. What would this person say to this? And I have emulations, simulations, and I throw back and forths. And a bunch of it happens at a conceptual level. It's difficult for me to say specifically, sorry, explicitly, to disambiguate, it's ambiguous. And I see these, I see connections. So when sometimes people ask us like, hey, what's your, what, what's your favorite toll? And that's, it's asked as if there are several different tolls. Whereas the way that I'm seeing it more and more is that almost each of these tolls are reflections of something underlying that's deeper. And it, of course the, the analogy is like, you know, they touch one person is touching the trunk and the other person is touching the tail of the leg. And they think they're different objects. Well, I think it's, I think it's more like much of the tilts that I read about and investigate, they're incomplete. So that's the, the touching of the tusk and sloshing, but they're also defiled in some way. So it's not a complete touching of the tusk. It's like someone's touching a tusk, but a window wiper at the same time. And so you need to remove all of that. It's, it's, it's like there's salt on the car and the windows need to be cleaned first. So it's, it's a, such a tricky topic. I also don't think it's just touching. I think that someone is experiencing rain and someone also smells a garden, but it's all like the, the rain is the elephant shooting out water from its tusk to start to his truck. Yeah. And it seems like it's completely different. It has nothing to do with feeling a long option for the pun one month, once a big bit. And so it's, I see, I intimate different relations. And I also see the, the contradiction between them that's fairly written sorry which readily to serve all well. yeah so where you know kind of to just to jump back to the pure toe side of things uh what's you know i imagine there's a spectrum of uh confidence you have in some of some of these to some degree um are there some that you are more likely to throw away that perhaps don't fit onto that map of the elephant quite yet, uh, that are more anomalous, would you say, uh, for whatever reason, or they are somewhat circled around the same elephant? I don't discount. But it's difficult for me to deride a subject. Even if I read it and I feel like, okay, this is clearly foolish. I've been so burned in my past by me thinking that I knew what was right and wrong, morally first to him, but also cognitively, like model-wise. And then having that swept away underneath me, that it's difficult for me to say, well, that's complete BS. Yeah, I don't scorn. My mind isn't big. It's just, I think temperamentally, I'm a judgmental type who dismisses and derides. And I've trained myself or, or from personal pain, I've come to be much more slow with my judgments and withholding it's less about judgment whether you believe it's uh about theory or not but you suggested that a lot of these theories seem to be uh you know located around a mean or essentially around a centralized theme an elephant that you're touching different parts of right so that would suggest perhaps there are some that are anomalous to that elephant that are outside of of that you know that median uh, problem set that the, those theories of everything I'm working on. Are there some that are completely out the lunch as far as conceptually or to our standard yeah. physics right now that are anomalous in a sense that it's not that a lot of throw it away, it's just outside of our expectations to a higher degree than the others? Yeah, I'm, 
there are some, there's some that I tag if I feel like, well, one, I need some prerequisite to understand this, like mathematical prerequisite, or one or two because it's, like you mentioned, low confidence. And then I don't like to think of it like that, but let's just say that for now. Then I tag it to read later. So I don't say no, I just say question marks. I put more question marks on it. Yeah, we're good. Uh, what about the, the individuals you've spoken to on the Theory of Everything podcast, on, on the two, on the toe uh, theme as well? So uh, do you have any kind of favorites or any anything that really stuck out to you meeting some of these individuals? Because you've met some extremely high caliber, you know, theoretical physicists and mathematicians and, you know, go down the whole list. It's, this is not politically correct for me to say, but it's it's not as if I have favorites or like I have just a few not favorites. Sure. So I'm impressed by 99% of them. Made not nine nine. By the majority of guests. And uh, I guess, you know, similar question applies on the consciousness side. Were there uh, any theories that were, you know, more outside of the spectrum of uh, what you were expecting? Or Initially, Bernardo Castro's idealism, which states that Rather than thinking of material as fundamental, you think of consciousness as fundamental, or percepts as fundamental, or quality as fundamental, or mind, or mental mentality as fundamental. But he has analytic idealism, which is like a subset of idealism. Because I, much like materialism is massive, ideal, I think is far below that. The complexity doesn't give any more reality to myself, it's just, I'm saying it's more massed. For when, so I could, but it could just be, because I'm so trained as a materialist front, going to a person. In fact, it's just deep. It's some theory that's material, but always much more easy for any of us in the West to grasp than what that's ideal. Yeah, so I would say that. Are there any episodes that you think are kind of your best work or highlighted work on the consciousness side that you'd like to share right now or you can? Leonardo Castro's, Donald Hoffman's, and Ian McGilchrist. Those are especially Ian McGilchrist. I mean, Carl Frist. Okay. The Carl Friston borders on on idealism versus materialism. He gives us a framework. This is more of a framework. Okay. Like quantum field theory is a quantum field theory is a framework. Then the standard model is a specific quantum field theory. It's like that. Okay, got it. Uh, we'll we'll put up the gotten those. Check them. Out. Sure, sure. Very good. Uh, were, were there any? If you happen to watch any of the non UFO or sorry, UAP, so if you if you have watched any of the non UEP episode, was there one that stuck out to you? I really enjoy uh, Donald Hoffman's work. Uh, it's always interesting listening to his, you know, his take on uh, to bond. our inability to objectively observe reality. Uh, because whenever I hear him talk on that topic, it just gives me lots of interesting ideas. <laughs> you know, he's just kind of lots of rabbit holes you can go down. So I think that's a, a great way of. Uh, out, you know, exploring our own biases in a way that we may not be necessarily aware. And of course, we're all we're prone to so many biases, but this is almost at like a fundamental bias, to, you know, a little biological level, or you know, a a, a mathematical level, you know, for the bio the mathematics that run our biology and our evolution in a set of suits. So, uh, that's one of my favorites. It's interesting that the realist perspective, that the common sense realist perspective, not up to Demi. But I mean, uh, folk psychology, realist perspective, is the controversial one. And now it's just accepted that there's non... If your theory doesn't incorporate somehow that your experience is an illusion of a sense that it's... Then it's a controversial theory, whereas prior... Now, yeah, it has been a switch. Well, what do you think the primary push for that? I think we suffer plenty. And I think that we hope to escape our suffering. And one route to doing so is by saying that the suffering itself is an illusion. That we despise suffering so much that we're willing to give up other aspects that we love in order to escape from the suffering. So this illusory aspect, of, and also rise the psychedelics is all of the illusory aspect. That means self feed precipitated by a loss of meaning and culture across the decades 
a loss of transcendence, of a feeling of being connected to something transcendent. And also self loathing What I mean by that is that since the 50s or so, we start to love the East, or at least what we think of as the East, which is often a bastardization, but at least it's not the West. We start to think of the West as just wrong, or not in our symbols. It's like a cultural self loathing I don't think the East sits around and thinks, how are we wrong? Let's incorporate more of the West. But we in the West, there's this, it's become, it's politically incorrect to say almost any, to give credence to any metaphysical idea of the West. We think of the East as much more bi multiplicative and complex and more, and thus more real and that we're much more simple. But it also could be related to that we just grew up in the West. So what we think of as simple is just because we grew up with it, much like English. And don't have the faith to comprehend these sentences. Yeah, I imagine people, you know, living in various countries in Asia, their culture is not overly complex of that. It's just greatly right. natural. And the West seems, you know, chaotic and crazy. Except, except now, well, for the past 1,000 years or so, there's the West influence on the East. So they may be able to grasp the West much more readily than we're able to grasp the East. Do you think that that's a purely organic perception that we have, or do you think that is influenced by, you know, international relations and interactions and, you know, social media attacks and all the other influences that, you know, affect our culture? Do you think that's mostly an or organic state of mind that we have for the East versus West perspective? I think there's something inorganic about it. See, there's this word supernatural, and God is supernatural, and religious belief is about the supernatural. And I used to believe that too. However, the H, well, not ancients, though, say medieval writings, is that God is the most natural. You can't say God is supernatural. God is the most natural. If anything, we're the defiled versions of something sacred. So maybe there's something inorganic about it. And that when we're on a, a correct path, we feel less suffering, we feel more connected. And also, by the way, I don't think it's all just about connection. I think there's a level of disconnectedness that has to occur as well. And there's some balance that we're swaying. It's like there are these cultural pendulums that sway. Oneness swung toward the side of connectedness as private. Because we're so disconnected, or we keep we up this perception of this stage. Are we connected or are we disconnected in this? I think we're both. I think we must be both. But this is my present deliberation. Yeah. So my thoughts on this, much like on a virtually any other subject, change week by week right and for certain month, and certainly month by month. I remember when we spoke, I said that I. I'm so averse to being interviewed. Well, first, they can't sing to me. Senate. It's, and second, well, the reason is that almost all my thoughts are, well, this is my present deliberation. And my first deliberation is, I don't know. And then my second one is intense to thought. And then that just escapes. But I, I don't identify with that. But just say, he, he here's a possibility. May I ask you a question? Sure. How important do you find the study of consciousness? Extremely important. Uh, yeah, it is. It is whether we believe it's fundamental to the universe or not. It's fundamental to our experience of it. Uh, so it's, I think that's incredibly important, and it's it's something that we really don't have a clean understanding even of what it is. Never mind. Uh, what the implications of even better knowing it would be, right? Uh, but I think that's you know something we never even think about as well. What 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 derives from us better understanding of consciousness is it though? Is it cleaner, better mind? Is it a, a better uh, way of interacting with the universe? Is it uh, is it of you know being able to manage four thoughts or more complex emotions? I, I don't know what the implications of a better understanding of consciousness are, but whenever we do understand something, we tweak it and make it better. Um, and so. That's one thing like that, would you just be curious? I'm curious about if this 
untrammeled investigation into consciousness or physics, or any endeavor scientifically, will lead us to a positive place. I think there's just this assumption that the more that we investigate, that the better it will be. It's like a commitment that truth is positive in some way, or scientific truth is positive. I don't see that as being irref irrefutable. So, for instance, we developed the atomic bomb through analyzing through the scientific method. I don't think that was terribly wise. Same with certain chemicals. Chemicals isn't virulent. Chemicals aren't harsh. Or but we do it anyways, right? The march continues form. So uh, whether on, indi on individual analysis, they're uh, best for our development. We do have that drive to continue to create, to continue to to do that. So. Uh, that seems to be another thing that we're almost out of control in the sense where our technological development uh, often, or almost always, I should say, progresses much, much faster than any type of cultural development uh, that we need to follow in a sense. Yeah. Um, one of the, one of the t things I thought about personally is whether you know that would be the definition of advanced society or culture would be that their culture moves as fast as their technology, or at least their technology waits for their culture to to need it or to adapt so it's being mature enough for it that's an interesting point do you think that and when you say culture advancing see the way i'd say that is is wisdom those are wisdom metric to ignore you see ourselves in the past as being more wise than the present no uh i do not see us being not yet right so i think we're too small of a delta at this point we're still you know in the in the mix and the fury of invention moving technological progress forward uh with little consideration for the societal or cultural impacts of that technology. That's just where we are. Now. And that, you know, that's progressing faster and faster in a set. So I don't know how that pendulum slows the other direction. You know, and so there, I think about, well, how do you classify with some for the number audit? Like I achieve just a chunk measure intelligence and so on. Several, several rabbit holes. I don't know if we're, I hope to it lies. I hope that we, people like John Verbeke and Evan and Space Wizzo are extremely important to people like John Devin Dessert, so people like Evan and Space Wizzo, the person's concept. The, well, that concept and John Verbeke's work, Ian McGilpert's work is extremely important. This puts forward something that we don't like to talk about, which is morality. If any, and physicists, by the way, despise talking about her. Talking about anything philosophical, same with mathematicians. I was at this dinner with a couple mathematicians. One of them went to Washington, and then this mathematician was told, it's like, Jack, no, I asked it. another mathematician. Line. It's a third mathematician, a friend of mine, about this consciousness, something like consciousness. And then she said, yeah, there's nothing, I can't define it ex specifically, so I'm just, that's, I, I don't think there's anything to contribute there. But then I was like, chat, that's how mathematicians think, isn't it? And this is a that's when I claims. Then the other friend came back from the washroom. And then he asked him, he's like, what, so what do you make of consciousness, the hard problem of consciousness, consciousness? He said to me things. And after like 10 seconds, he says, no, I can't define it properly. So it's just not an interesting problem. <laughs> and then we're like, that's exactly what almost every mathematician thinks. If it's not defined, if it's ill-defined, let's forget about it. However, all of our ill-defined words, firstly, almost every day, Every single thing that's important to us is ill-defined. So while for spouse, quality of consciousness, every subjective experience, as virtually every single thing is ill-defined. And the more that it matters, the more that it seems ill-defined. And mathematics is the domain of this specifically defined. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there's a great reason why those who are, who have a proclivity to go toward the defined dislike the ill defined. Well, there are philosophers in mathematics and I'm super interested in how the heck did they come up with that personality could cease to involve both. Yeah. So, okay, that's very interesting. And I would wonder if that relates to the, the UAP topic at all, uh, at least to some degree. Uh, often experiences in that area are subjective. It's how everyone is always uh, looking for more objective data that we can utilize for study and things of that nature. Uh, you've had a number of people on 
your podcast to uh, that were non-physicists, things of that nature. And you went strictly into the UAP topic. So first off, you know, how did you make that transition? Uh, maybe we can just start there. So. Sure. I wouldn't say it went strictly to the UAP topic. Oh, no, no, yeah. But you, you, you were I turned and now shifted into just the third. You were told. You were told. Got it. Yeah. But you were, you were inviting guests on that were specific to the UAP topic versus introducing the UAP topic to your, you know, your physicist guests and things of that. Yeah. You know, there's this idea that there's a stigma, and this is something that I think about quite frequently. I don't think there is a stigma. I think that there's something called a collective illusion, and heard of collective illusions. I do define it for us. This is an extremely important topic. I think more people should know about this. It's it's a bit difficult to explain. So let's say that you have a privately held belief, and then you act in contradiction with that belief, in a manner that comports with how other people act. But they so they share that contradictive public belief, mm-hmm. but they also privately hold the same belief. And mm-hmm. so explain in other ways. You go along with the view that you believe other people share, though they don't share, but they believe you share it, so they go along with it. It's almost like the emperor has no clothes, except in that one is the primary aspect is top down, emperor. Whereas this one is bottom up. For instance, some examples help. In the 1960s, the majority of people were against segregation. However, publicly they pretended that they were for it because they believed their neighbors did. Okay, so it's it's dangerous in a in a sense for the present collective illusions. They also so another collective illusion is that we we think that what matters or we say what matters to the most people is wealth and status. However, in surveys, actually what matters to us, and also if you look at the way people spend their time with the family, they prioritize family, or they say they care about family and they spend for that. And simple pleasures involved like eating at restaurants and so on. They don't actually care too much about someone's wealth and status. Now, the danger is that the collective illusions of our generation become the reality of the next of the next generation. So that is, kids hear, oh, what matters most is wealth and stat and status. So then they're on Instagram, and then they feel horrible, and then and then that's what they chase: is the likes and the followers and subscribers. Is seen. I think stigma, the stigma of UFOs is like a collective illusion. And the reason I say that is that I won't say people's names because they talk to me off air, but several of the professors that I spoke to on the channel, professors, fields medalists even, award-winning professors, I'd say that, in mathematics, would come to me afterward to say, okay, that's great now that we talked about the algebra and so on, the monster group and so on. What the heck is going on? It's really being talked about. How come more people are talking about it? And then they ask me, like, privately, like, hey, so what confidence do you put that something extraordinary is going on? I'd say extraordinary? Well, my present deliberation is like 70%, but I include that something that the government develops is extraordinary. I still think I met the government has that tech that's absolutely fascinating. So I'm not saying it's your first choice, well, you've stroked over. And then they're like, man, that's all I'm hoping like 90%. This is where I think that programs like yours told to some degree other people's podcasts and and even New York Times 2017 are important because they have people who are reputable and I don't even like that term man like some versus more legitimate than another person we can talk about that after regardless colloquially these are more reputable quoting both people talking about the UFO subject and and see I don't think we have a stigma problem I think we have a cowardice problem and I think scientists are at the root of it as soon as a scientist makes a subject legitimate by talking about it then the public sees the public sees them as the as the people who ordain what is worthy of being spoken about with it legitimate in a in a non-anti-scientific way in a rational way how do you like paradise that with this with what you're doing that's great it's great and also people who watch like if you're watching this sometimes and i get this like maybe you get this too 
we're watching shows like with the, the heads of the UFO topic, like Will Zondo, Gary Nolan, and and Greer, and with Motel and so on. And we're just watching, we're like, I have like new information. Where is the new information? And then you're hoping maybe they slip up. Maybe they say something that, that you could read between the lines where they explicitly say something so, oops, and then just the pop tester left it in. Symphony. But then you're just disappointed constantly. They're like, oh, oh my gosh, why am I watching this? However, I think that simply by watching the views and the, the normalization of this topic itself counts. So even by watching, this is like the nurse crumb. This is like a necessary precondition for disclosure to occur. Okay, so I think it goes like this. And the, the word nurse crop is important. It's not a important word. It's like a... Daniel Dennis said that Christianity was the nurse crop of science. And that's controversial. He said, I don't say. What it means is that why did science develop in the West? Well, firstly, to think about the West developing the science is a, this bit of a... is diluting what occurs in. But let's in broad strokes say that that occurred. Why? Well, there is something about Christianity and and found even the sacred is seen the logos and structure behind reality and that the church funding investigation into natural science before it was in cult science natural philosophy to him. And so he said, while he dislikes Christianity even because he dislikes all religion, he said Christianity seems to be a nurse crop for science. I think that scientists talking about UFOs, or sorry, or UAVs, even the fact that I have to say sorry, because that word is so scorned and so disparaged. Even Mac is like, that's, a, that's an issue, regardless. Scientists talking about UAPs, I think those in the step field, physicists, mathematicians, they, they have such a responsibility, and they didn't, they, don't, they didn't know, they didn't come into this knowing that they have a vital position to play in society, they just came into it because they, they like positive stereotypes. Yeah. But now they have a role, a huge role to play. I think they're the nurse crop. I think it starts with them, and it becomes legitimate. And then the government will talk about it more. Further, we think of the government as this big daddy, as this big brother or, or big mother. And us as children that need to go to said father or, or mother. But I think we're not children. I think we're teens that are so close to the drinking age. So close, so close to driving, which hopefully not being blocked at the same time. But what, what agent, if we're the one, even if the government discloses, what the heck does disclosure mean? You talk about that too. Even if the government discloses, it's not like we'll believe the government. We want to verify what the government says. Whether they say we have no bodies, we have no craft. They're like, yeah, prove it. We have craft. Yeah, prove it. So no matter what, if I have to go down to the scientific body at some point, and then from there to an open mind. Yep, I, I agree with you. You know, one of the things I've been seeing through the work that I've been doing is, I've been using a slightly different term. Yours is, I'm sure, much more accurate, but just kind of a, a latent interest in this topic. Like you said, people are interested in this uh, at a personal level, but just as you described, uh, there's, uh, there's that wall, that social wall, where people don't seem to want to engage because the expectation is... Uh, you know, embarrassment or ridicule or something of that nature. I, I loosely just call that stigma. But um, what I've been seeing are people reaching out and engaging on this topic, much like, you know, you spoke to, uh, you know, once the mic's off, people want to engage on this topic. I've been seeing that happen more and more. And uh, at the uh, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, uh, we've been getting some, you know, long-time career scientists, engineers within uh, the aerospace industry and elsewhere that are kind of over that hump, you can say, and are kind of putting their name on the line and are standing up to help figure this out uh, and to prove aerospace safety in doing so. And so, you know, I don't think it's evenly distributed, but I think we are seeing a very positive trend where people are willing to kind of step out onto that onto that ledge, if you will, and say, hey, you know, we're just going to do objective science on this and all this, you know, phenomenon that we have in front of us. What I'm super interested in it's not just investigating UAPs, but what the heck could that mean for science and the methodology of science? So I talk about science 2.0 or Abich Gnosis. Abich is like the Eastern way of the Eastern mode knowing that Gnosis is the Western way of knowing that right now science is at a big time. As a blanket call of Western, even though that's all over generalization, she thought. So. Even saying the East is 
It's a generalization. Sure. Because there's several different religions. What are you talking? Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism. If you have non-repeatable events that you can't falsify, that you have to incorporate someone's anecdote to, how the heck do you make that comport with science? Currently in Kent, science requires repeatability and falsifiability. But science, this is why I think that the disadvantage that we see in UAP, UAPs, such as these anomalous events, is our opportunity. So, the quantum mechanics, okay, we see this, the, we can't directly observe these UAPs reliably, what we call, oh, except in nice old cases. In quantum mechanics, there's something called weak measurements that was invented in order to get some information about the wave function without collapsing it technically without decohering it. And, and that was developed because there, there's that weakness in one of the that you can't observe without changing or collapsing or both. So what we thought of as a weakness ended up becoming a technological revolution. Well, I, well, has had heavy implications of quantum computing and quantum information theory. And even dark matter, you can't directly observe dark matter yet as we may alter our fundamental laws to incorporate them or discover new particle or, or see indirectly as it was. I think we have an opportunity here to, I don't know what the heck this looks like. I think that science right now is like a pre-science, like a pre-Aristotelian science. It's at that stage and it's going to develop into something else. But what we're doing right now is we're, well, we're laying some groundwork super interesting what the heck is science 2.0 given science has developed to what it is now it didn't just encourage from a bubble there's a history of science it takes books it takes chapters it takes often bookshelves are there any potential problems in our world right now that you think would be problems that would be solved by this type of 2.0 science you know so obviously the one to buy it is uaps you know uaps are a mystery to us and again they're anomalous phenomena which is a a science, you know, a scientific term, anomalous data, things of that nature are, are opportunities for discovery and for moving things forward. Uh, and people who may hear anomalous phenomena think of that purely from a kind of sci-fi-ish angle or something of that nature. But perhaps you could talk for a minute to what, when you hear anomalous phenomena from a scientific perspective, why is that part of information? From a scientific perspective, it's not from... A scientist's perspective, which is different, by the way, because scientific perspective is just the methodology or the scientific method. But the scientist has a has a penchant for being curious and innovating. Even something like Fermat's last theory, which is super easy to state: a to the n plus b to the n plus c to the n, or integers with n greater than two. It's extreme. It's like a puzzle that's simply easy to state, but then you have to develop tools over several hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, over decades. I don't remember one firm at Gable, came out and picked some to God, or eight to nine. I think it's up to hundred. So over at least a hundred years. It's a difficult problem, and so it should We, Well, everyone has their own federal elections, but it for myself, I'm just super interested in it. It's like this huge puzzle. I've always been interested in puzzles. Since I was a kid, I just love, I like Rubik's Cubes, I like Putnam Problems and Mad, I like playing around with, I like logic puzzles and paradoxes. I also think there's something to do with paradoxes here, mind the way, which we could talk about at other point, either here or at some other point. Paradox is super interesting. There's something paradoxical happening here. By the way, the way math lives is that you allow we construct math in such a way that there's no contradiction. So we'll walk in and then take logic as the base. But you allow that what develops from math to contradict your common sense. So that is, you take the logical base as more fundamental. However, there are, there are quote unquote, logical paradoxes. So then what's more fundamental than logic? There's a treatise on right right now, just so I can understand it better. If it comes into a book form, I don't know, but it's like a disquisition, a personal disquisition. On paradoxes and interpretations of quantum mechanics. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, so a big book. Yeah, that <laughs> old man. Well, okay, so that kind of 
I can see how you would be motivated to look into the UAP topic then. You know, it's a, it is a puzzle and, and it's difficult. So, you know, have you, we talked about bridges between consciousness and, and toes. Uh, have you seen any bridges between UAP and consciousness or, or toes as well? Yeah, I, I hear that. I hear that there is connection between UAPs and consciousness. And as far as I can tell, it means that if you perform something like CE5 and you get in contact with supposed to or assets, but in contact with aliens or extraterrestrials, and CE5 is a meditative technique or devolves meditation or falls chanta, whatever it may be, something consciousness related. And so that's one of the reasons, but also because some people can take psychedelics and they believe they're encountering what is akin to something extraterrestrial. So that's as far as the connection between UAPs and consciousness. And then also be making an association between what they've encountered and what's behind what's seen on radar and photos and so on. And first of So that's the, uh, as far as I could tell, that's the connection. You're good. Does it go further than that? Is it explicated like Donald Hoffman's theory, which is their paper on it? that makes a connection between UAPs and consciousness. There may be. So there's some people, there's Jack Sarfati, who's a, a physicist, or at least a former physicist, at least. And then there's Hal Putoff and Herod Davis, Salvatore Pius, and Jean Pierre Petit, and they have their own theories. And so maybe and in the future, something I'd like to work on is each bringing their theories together. It's it, because what like Ryan, like you must feel as you do this, so we're so lucky, we're both so lucky that we get to talk to almost whoever we want to talk to, almost, and just and sit with them for hours. So I have so someone like Eric Davis or Jack Jack Sarfati or Hogwoodoff Valley and so on. They may not be able to speak to Penrose. But I may be able to speak to Enlos up then soon. So I can look at their equations and I can pose it to him and hear what he thinks. And thus have a tomanza in my head between these people. It's just, it's such a, it's such a privilege. Man. Have you considered mixing that up to a greater degree? As far as those, those communities set up? And it yes, did do it yeah, through the yeah. tomanza, but you know, even more so perhaps. I, I think that's happening. I think it's happening slow. I think what you're doing is like, it's like this spark on a on a dry seal, and I, I, for some reason I don't like the word normalization or destigmatization, but those are the only words I could come up with. Because it's the frequency at which these conversations are put out in such a way that isn't what the History Channel portrays as ancient aliens, which is what we think of as. That's anti-science, that's a distraction, that's sensational, that's illegitimate, that is mass delusion and hallucinations or whatever it may be that the public or the general view of them. Well, disesteeming people will be your residents have been solved. So by having conversations, conversations, podcasts, interviews, even by watching them, showing that there's interest, in that's why I'm saying that it's not just me and you or, or people who are on the screens, people who are, who are watching or listening, it, they, this would be nothing without them. So when they were watching, they were disappointed, much like I am all the time, by the, the lack of disclosure. Beauty. Disclosure, for quotations. In some sense, this is on your screen. The reason I put disclosure in quotations is because we think of the government as disclosing, but the more that I investigate this the more that I see the government's fractionate into actions. And so it's like a game of broken telephone where you don't even have access to the original message to compare and laugh. And plus they're, they're competing factions. Some don't want information to come out. Some want altered information to come out. Some want more money. We say, yeah, it's in a black budget. It's in the black budget, the black budget, as if there's just one black budget department of the government. So it's, I'm so not surprised that these reports are vague, that they give little away, other than saying that there are anomalous objects and that seem to be from us. 
and and, and I like the work of Jot Greenwald requests FOIA, puts in FOIA requests. I enjoy I enjoy all the perspectives and I enjoy the skeptics. I like Big West. I like Stephen Green Street, and I just I just like to hear every perspective. It's just it, I, I, it's almost like a like Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, he doesn't say, I'm going to discount that testimonial. I'm going to discount that. Almost nothing is discounted. He rarely says, he doesn't even think of data points. He thinks in terms of clues. And so that's the way that I see it. It's their clues. And it's, like a, I, like, it's like I'm a, a Sherlock Holmes of physics primarily. Can't see different clues, try to put them together to come up with a singular solution. But then as I start to investigate this, just try to see is you start off with a, a Ramos conjectural tree and then you whittle it down. And certain evidence, certain absence of evidence can miss. You know the, the dog and Joe off owns the barking dog. And remember that? Yep. Yeah. So, okay, so, so audience um, doesn't know about Great reason. Yeah. There was, I mean, I forgot the story and just remember the punchline, which is that there was a dog, someone owned a dog, and I guess someone broke in or there's some transgression property. But the dog didn't bark. And then most people just ignored that. Sherlock Holmes, but big state and all that said, the dog didn't bark. Why? Because Dogs don't bark at people that they know. So therefore, this must be someone that is familiar with the dog, where dog's familiar with. That alone, well, that's like a massive insight. You talk to a lot of people, both in the, the tow world, the cautious world, and uh, the UAP slash UFO world. Uh, and you're, you, you know, you're gathering a lot of information from a lot of, a lot of minds, a lot of stories. You know, what, what are you putting together from now on the UAP topic that, you know, sticks out to you? It's a great question. You're a great interviewer, interviewer, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm just having a conversation. Just trying to it. Okay, you're a great person in the discussion. Very good. Very good. Thank you. You are as well. Yeah, that's... I see contradictions. So first thing, I see contradictions pointing at places like one, I, the public is, is extremely interested in the subject, yet there's little use coverage. The government has been well, silent, but also contradictory on this topic. The, this, U, this UAP phenomenon appears to some people and not others. Apparently it's widespread, yet with photos that are accessible by the public, there's few that are, that you've been looking at and say, wow, okay, that's great. That's something. There's always some element of breed to itself. The few did though, that's the case with any piece of data back. So there are contradictions. Whether they're true contradictions in the antinomy sense, like logical contradictions, or just doesn't seem like these two should comport. I don't know. And I need to think about that some more, but that's why one of the reasons that I'm super interested in size 2.0, IPJ as they call it, and it's on purpose has this strange date and try to resolve paradoxes to see what's underneath paradoxes. I think, or at least I'm betting my time, my energy on that that's a place that'll move the deal for. That's my present deliberation. Are there specific paradoxes in the UAP realm? A little different than contradictions, perhaps, but are there four specific paradoxes that you think you've identified in the UAP environment? I mean, you just named some, yeah, I don't know if there's, you went through some that are, you know, kind of other ends of the spectrum, but not necessarily paradoxes. I think there's, you know, there's a logical pathway to explain them. Um, yeah, I, to be frank, I'm not quite sure what the exact definition of the two, to, the delta between the two would be. Uh, but anyways, maybe you could well. The paradoxes of UFOs as they relate to consciousness is one that I can scarcely say without it's difficult for me to get out like it's just some amount of terror. Okay. This topic is not a, a fun topic. Like, in some ways it's fun, but it's not a... 
it's fun in the way that a roller coaster is fun. So there's some exhilaration to it, but there's also terror. So the, the roller coaster has much more exhilaration, playfulness to it. But imagine you're on a roller coaster. You didn't know this was made by Cuffino or if there's safety checks. Yeah. You're going to be freak the heck out. Yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. We had a hug. That's what it's like. And that's something else that I think may be, I, I don't know, holding us back is the right way of thinking about it, but it's something that's not considered enough. If you can't think of a way in which studying this topic or studying any topic can lead to a place where you would beg to not have known the answer, to beg and plead for something to rewind time, then you're not thinking serious enough about the topic. I think people in the DI are not doing that enough. They should be more ethics in the DI. I think they're going to burn their hands, much like Einstein said, I'm going to burn. I wish I'd burned my hands before inventing E equals M to squared or signing off that you should investigate and do it all. Yeah, if you can't do that thought experiment to find the balance, then I don't think, I think you should pause. Do you think that there's a wall out there on the UAP topic that is either psychological or social that, you know, requires us to be ready for particular information so that it is easier to get over? Is that what you're suggesting? So that we can investigate it properly and consider what the heck are we doing? What does it mean to investigate them? How should we be investigating? Compared to the dark forest. Yes. So do you, would you like to explain it? Already with me too. So, I'll give a four minute aside on the story. There's this set of books by a Chinese author called The Remembrance Spirit. It's past, I believe. And it's, a, it's at least a three part series. I think there's a fourth, but was written by the same author regarding this. The, the storyline is that this is the year 2100, something like that. And I'm going to clump together several pieces of, of the story and make four people, one person, and so all just for the sick kid himself. Sure. There's this scientist who finds a way to communicate to outside the galaxy. Let's take to the universe. She does so. The way that she does it is she shoots some ray to the sun and it expands. And she says, hey, come help us. We're here. We're, at, we're on Earth. She gets a message back. By the way, this, is, this whole story is about one way of interpreting it is one is an explanation as to the Furby paradox. So, is why don't we see more intelligent life out of it? Here's something to consider. She gets a message back and it says, If you know what's good for you, don't send me any more messages. I am benevolent, but this place is not. Be careful. She sits and thinks with it for a while and she says, You know what? And she says, Not a message. Earth is so barbaric and truculent and savage. We need saving. This is, there's too much fighting. The humans, humans are, are not great people and governments are not great. Okay. That person who sent the message that said, like, be careful. Don't, don't send any more messages. That person was like a rogue scientist from this other civilization. That person gets executed because they were, they were supposed to be notifying everyone else that came about before the message. It turns out, and this civilization, the alien civilization called the tri -Solarans. it turns out that the Earth, that the universe is an extremely chaotic place. It's called the three-body orbit. In the book is the first on the three-body problem, right? Because a three-body orbit is unstable, bad man. Unlike a two-body orbit, they're in so it's, it's just, and, it's just, and we have a resource here on Earth. And that resource isn't isn't grass, it's not water, it's stability. It's the fact that we can even observe loss and make regularities. Wolfram, to integrate some of the tools, Wolfram may call this a pocket of reducibility. We're in a pocket of reducibility. I thought that's a resource in and of itself. And the other places, they don't have this. And one of the reasons why we see, well, there's the Variani symmetry, and then we don't have the Hubble tension and so on. We think these are problems with our laws, but it's, pro it's the problem with conceptualizing laws in the first place. We're not taking into account that the universe could be chaotic and unstable in it. We think the universe is all here. No. So then the Trisolar is like, oh my gosh, there's a place where we can go because we're, we're out to die. 
we're just, by the way, a couple, maybe decades or a few hundred years more civilized than the civilized, more technologically advanced than the humans of the British space. Let's go there right then. So then they start heading to Earth. Then somehow they're communicating with the Earthlings. And just like now, you hear the same rhetoric. Half of the Earth, and I'm again generalized, half of the Earth views them as like, they're the saviors, they're the gods coming to save us. But the other half says, no, 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 be effing careful then. Like there's something demonic about this, or at least that this is not in our best interest. Then there's fighting, there's wars. Earth suddenly, not some, Earth over the course of decades comes together and says, okay, we need to mount a defense. The most amount of energy, resources, and time go into mounting a defense against this because they're considering, well, what the worst case scenario. And they make these fleets and they make these fleets so that they could protect themselves. And they're observing the solar system saying like, okay, it's now hundreds of years later, they're coming, they're coming in decades or maybe even in 10 years. Let's, let's be careful about the threat and put it. What we think of is all the effort that went into the nuclear bomb and into the pyramids and so on, this like that turns up thousands of all of Earth is on this, and then, then they they observe that he that okay we're looking for irre irregularities we're looking for something out of place they see like this droplet, a fine that she dropped the liquid and then they're like okay they're cautious so they're like let's let's see what that is they go to grab it and like Magneto from Pixman I don't know if you saw first I said where there's one sphere that quickly destroys everything and then this one droplet quickly destroys. Earth's entire fleet and over the course of just seconds and they're different fleets like first, second, third the first fleet is destroyed like that and the second one can barely cover head it's like they have DI and best DI and even the DI can't you know like what the heck just happened and then they get destroyed and then the third gets destroyed and now Earth is in this dark age wonder how wise it would be to use artificial intelligence to create military strategy in something that you have zero data on yeah, the way that AI works is current and has a huge size. Plenty, plenty of data. But I can't even just give the AI, AI machine learning. I get one data thing. Yeah. But so, so you know, the Dark Force, you know, at least philosophy according to um, that book series is that uh, the Fermi paradox is uh, is resolved by the fact that there are things out there, we just can't see them because they're specifically hiding due to the political and war nature of uh, the large universe, and that's based on the assumption of uh, limited resources, uh, as well as uh, the fact that technological progression happens over such short periods of time, which are all things that we observe with our own civilization. Of course, we don't have the data sets uh, from elsewhere. As well as self-interest, we are self-interested in every other species we know is willing to kill another species to save their own. Why wouldn't we think that that universal property wouldn't be universal or at least extremely likely one thing I, I i like to think about in that book series as well is you know maybe we're the trisolarans right maybe maybe you know did every trisolar know that they lived in an in, in between areas of upheaval in a sense right so uh, i've always kind of thought of it you know i placed myself in that their shoes and said you know perhaps we're just in the midst of a, of a calm period uh, in a sense if there's upheavals elsewhere uh, we don't know what, what stability is and what the time frames are for uh, certain biological process that evolutionary time period to get from, you know, A to G might be uh, a certain time period, but for uh, different different points in that evolutionary process, uh, there might be... Well, it, it, goes, it goes into what you're saying about wisdom versus technology. We are so unwise that we don't even like the concept of wisdom. Or objective morality. If we're going to study it, it's to say that there's subjective morality. That's why a physicist and a if they're going to make a comment at all about it, they live in the world of the defined. They don't like to make ambiguous statements. Say like a mathematician, like the opposite of a politician. Read your bad sense. A politician wants you to read anything into the statements that are, that are made. Math is just saying, oh, here's exactly what I mean. So they don't like morality. And they fall. Where it up. Carlin Hume, by the way, had a whole book on UFOs. He was saying that it's a psychological projection of the collective unconscious is a representation of the man's search for meaning and transcendence. 
okay, if that's the case, so at least if that's even partially the case, then the reason for the increased in sightings of UAPs since the world war, world war one, world war two, maybe because our culture is so lacking. We're, we're so, you constantly hear this, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I kept this longing for spiritual growth. And then there's this loss of the church. And so we've erected in place of the church technology. We just worship this technology. And maybe because, well, Carl Jung was right about plenty. But the whole field of psychoanalysis is based, it's partially on Carl Eaton's work. Maybe there's something to do with with a longing. And, but then, then it's like, well, when people encounter it, is it because they, it's, is it the more spiritually ended people, the people who are longing or people who are trying to grow? I don't think that's always the case. So is it the people who are lacking? Well, is it just both ends? Is it the people who are in the middle? The ones that are like, yeah, I'm actually fine. That don't encounter them much. Cool, no. It would give an explanation as to why the skeptics and the hard nosed and the somewhat proud skeptics don't see them much. They don't feel as if they lack meaning. They're extremely horrible as look down at people. So they don't search for it. We don't care about search at all. If anything, the most thing we do would be meditating by right? so look how, look how rational I am. Just Dis disembroil my, my meditation for my spirituality and my religiosity and so on. I don't know. Is meditation a pure spiritual practice? I think, I think it is. You do? Yeah. That wasn't yeah. you said. I think that there's this, I've owned this, the present deliberation, remember, yeah. there's actually metaphysical assumptions embedded into meditation. So they'll say, just observe your thoughts. You are not your thoughts. And so on and so on. They're actually, you're being told a certain framework that you are not your thoughts. Observe these as the winds and the waves and so on. It's not simply do this practice. You can't just do this practice. You have to be told, instructed on how to do it. Do we take those as instructions as agnostic? But I don't think they are metaphysically. I, I disagree a little bit only because I think I learned when I started meditating as an adult that I used to do as a child, I just did it without knowing what I was doing. I used to, but you know, six, seven years old, I used to hold my breath in the pool and slowly blow the air out and sink to the bottom so I was weightless for as long as possible and hold my breath as long as I could. And I would just concentrate my, my focus on either the my heartbeat because I could feel it through the water and I would just try to make in that state as long as possible. And I would do that for, and then when I ran out of breath, I would come back up, take a single breath as much as I could, and then float back down, do that same process. I would do that for like 45 minutes to an hour, you know? And I just thought it was a relaxing thing to do. I didn't have a word for it. And then later I realized it was pretty much the same process, you know, mentally as what choosing to meditate and the control of focus and things of that nature, which is again, very similar to really when you're kind of in the groove or in the moment when you're flying a tactical aircraft we call it the scan and we just think of it as really moving our eyeballs eyeballs around to see information but really at the end of what we're doing is channeling our focus you know on one particular number one particular data point one particular problem that we need to solve and we do that for a particular period of time and we move on to the next piece of data the next piece of data we do that the repeating pattern all right we're not multitasking necessarily but we have that scan going on, and that's just controlled focus across the instruments, you know, or to keep ourselves doing what we need to do. And so I feel like I kind of, you know, I feel like that was the same process. No one taught me how to do it at the very beginning. I didn't really know what it was to have it work for until I, you know, posed it in my 30s or something. So that's my experience. Firstly, you're an author's. <laughs> no, no, no. It's like I've heard that. You're in good company because Carl Hume also had some experiences that you would think would only be cleaned if you were to be taught mindfulness meditation but as a young child and thirdly there are different kinds of meditation so what you're referencing isn't well even what i said isn't meditation it's like say the government the culture sure, yeah. the government different kinds of meditation is why it was i don't know the names of the others 20 others interesting 
Very good. So to kind of want to come back to the clues that you may have with the UFP or, you know, one thing that you mentioned and then we kind of fell off the topic was, what, what about absence of data? What does that say to you on the UAP topic? Are there any examples there? To just the wide dog. And there's, there's, there's the Fermi paradox as well. That's like an absence of data. Do be, what does that indicate? I don't know. Honestly, you can think about this for quite some time, but you can just. It's so, it's extremely tricky because you also don't want to pick up on patterns everywhere. That's the same as paranoia and schizophrenia. This example of too much meaning. So you have to be extremely careful of seeing meaning in every place. Or traditions is the word else is. Yeah. Right, right. My mind works in such a way that... In, so my answer is, I don't know. However, am I using the fact that there's a lack of data as some other stack in some other decision tree, I don't know. I'll give you an example. I was walking down in Troll the other day. And my and then I said to my wife, you know Alfred Hitchcock? She's like, yeah. And then she, so he said, here's what suspense is. And this is the difference between shock and suspense. Okay. It's two people are having a conversation. Five minutes later if there's a baller at the table that pulls up. That's shock. And Alfred Hitchcock was the inventor of suspense of Phil. And he's like, here's how many that's suspenseful. Stay in the situation just in the beginning, you show the bomb, and then you show up talking. Stay in conversation, and then you're thinking as an audience, like, oh my gosh, that's going to blow up. Sure. Like, what are you doing? You don't know that that's there? And it's just like, why did you say that right now? Then I'm like, why did you say that? Oh, because, thank you, the two seconds ago, there was this, a few moments ago, there's this guy who I thought, was he going to pickpocket? Like, I just had this thought, it's going to pickpocket me. Then I thought about this other movie called The Tick, where there was a tick, this pickpocket. Then I thought, yeah, well, Eric, Idris Albus had this, Idris Albus, I don't know how to say that. The, the actor in this, he was depressed by this kid. And I was thinking like, you could read all these emotions. He's impressed by him, he's thinking what, he's telling the truth. What else can he do? And all these emotions were going through Idris's head. And you could see that in his eyes. And then I was thinking, mm, if I was to direct that scene, what would I say? And then I was thinking, okay, as a director, no, I wouldn't give him that much destruction. All that's actually plenty of destruction. And I was thinking, okay, the, I'll, 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 about Alfred Hitchcock. Well, what would he say? And then I thought of that. Mm -hmm. Mitch is like, hey, but, and how exhausting is it? So what I'm saying is that you're asking me about am I consciously using the fact that there's a lack of data? No. But I don't know if it's one of those steps much like it took me quite some time to be like, why did I think of Alfred Hitchcock? We don't know, because this, 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 those, this, what's... Very good. I thought perhaps because you had mentioned that you had highlighted something already. What do you see, you know, other than just talking about it, like, you know, I'm attempting to do with this podcast, uh, what else do you think needs to be done move this conversation forward. Uh, we've talked a little bit about, you know, introducing the wider industry and academia to this topic. Obviously, you know, I'm going to take it from you now so you don't use this, but obviously more data and being able to distribute that data to a wider uh, cohort for analysis, things of that nature would be a wish list. But what do you think are pragmatic steps perhaps to continue this, move this conversation forward? Like I mentioned, the government, I don't know if whatever the government says, whether they have something or not, and what's the something, I don't know if that's enough. I don't think that would satisfy you, nor me, nor Big West. It would be, okay, well, what do you mean, can see it. So at some point you would have to get to the scientists. And then here's something I wonder, does private enterprise have more information on the phenomenon? Let me ask you that, and then I'll answer the question. Sure. Would that, that ask Okay, so what do you think that certain private enterprises have more access or more knowledge about what's going on, what the heck has happened, than the I don't have enough information to say, you know, why, fortunately, right? So, you know, we hear a lot about how, you know, potentially you could be moving materials or technology to the private industry um, such that it's not, you know, it's not up for grabs from, you know, a uh, elected official or a FOIA request or something of that nature, but I have no direct knowledge of that being a strategy that was implemented. Do you have any children? If you did, would you would you talk to them about UAP? That's a deep question. I think that's the deepest question. Now, at what point? At some point, yes. I would imagine like, I would, but I can't know until in, in that situation, far from such a situation. Mm -hmm. 
How about yourself? Do you have kids? I do. I have a daughter who's five. I heard. Uh, we talk about it a little bit. I mean, there's only so much we can talk to at a five year old, but uh, I don't. I, I introduce her to the concept of there being other consciousness elsewhere uh, in the universe, a galaxy, and also plants and life, things that are potentially not conscious. Uh, I draw a distinction there, uh, maybe not philosophically, but at least in this conversation. Uh, and so, yeah, I want her to understand that, you know, what we have going on, this little blue dot here isn't necessarily the center of the universe. I think that is an extremely important perspective for her to grow up happy. Because uh, I think it'll just increase her optionality and her imagination. And, you know, everything we have in the world that we've created has started in our head as an idea. So, you know, as a general philosophy, I try to encourage her thinking that expands, you know, her mindset, her exposure, uh, and, you know, her ability to try new things. And, uh, and I think not being set of universe is, you know, the first step of that sense. One thing I think about is that we think of the primary aspects of this world as either consciousness or material, and perhaps the dual to one another, perhaps one's derived from one another. But I have to wonder, well, what about a third element? What about a triality? Or what about a quadrality or a twelveality? Something in like the like what they call one hundred fifty-seven. So what about a one hundred fifty-sevenality? And what if these questions that we think are so ineffable and these escape us like why are we here what is consciousness how am i alive and so on what is our place what if they're those questions there's so we can't access from our from within a certain circle so within the consciousness circle we just can't much like girls that complete a stare with this so girls that complete a stare and says there's certain mathematical statements that you can't know the true or sorry and you can't prove what of it any in the system was within but there's some play of Alex Delayed that since they're doing that right. And what if, much like a child may ask, well, how does a how does a baby form, and where do I get my pants from, and what is money? And you're just like, just relax. Like there are, and these answers are first thing fairly trivial. There's an explanation. And thirdly, that's not even the most important question right now. Just just relax yourself. I wonder if like these existential questions that plague us, that the religious stories are correct in that. Just trust. Just relax. Just go along. Trust. You can't make sense of it. You're not meant to make sense of it. It also, not that it doesn't matter, but it may be futile and, and counterproductive. In many ways, it's counterproductive because it can just drive you mad. There, you can get mad delving into this. But in the same way you study a, a tiger leaping across the Sahara. Uh, to an infinite degree, but you truly don't understand uh, the mechanics of, of how you're seeing the lion or the photons coming at you. You're not really yeah. observe reality behind it. Yeah. Even if, is that even the reality? So here's something else. It's like we're so ingrained and scientifically to think that the science is primary and then our perceptions are secondary. And Bernard, something I like about Bernardo Castro, I like, uh, I just like ideas that make me think. He's saying, no, no, you start with your perception and then you derive the sides. He'll go the other way around. And so if you feel the solidity of an object, you, you don't then go scientifically and say, well, the spaces between the atoms and the orbitals is on so large that this, the, the, the grip that you have is an illusion. No, the grip is real. Somehow your phenomenal reality is real. And it takes primacy. And there's a whole field called phenomenology. It's like phenomenologist philosophy that says that your phenomenon is real. You take that as prank. Your being is real. You don't then go to something else to disprove that. You start from that and drive upward. It's even derivation is the proper way of going about it. It's presume something like reductionism. And it's difficult for me to not think reductionistically. Like what it's even in sometimes to you and myself. And people ask like what explains consciousness? Explains as a, what counts as an explanation? Like something is more is more real and then that gives rise what does it mean to give rise doesn't that just have no presume reductions what else what are the alternatives how can you even think non-reductionist holism sure what else is it how, how do i make my mind think well you don't say the experience of consciousness isn't the ultimate understanding versus all a mathematical equation that would describe consciousness 
Is that what you're getting at, at knowing really how to find or really to understand? Um, also, I apologize if earlier I gave the indication that I see some lack of evidence and some evidence like Sherlock Holmes did. I'm saying that I don't discount. And so if I see that there's a lack or something, it may be indicative of something. Very good. And slightly semantical, and I get it now. Very good. So I think you might have had some questions for me. Do commercial airliners, sorry, commercial commercial pilots encounter these? Yes. And are they, I would imagine that they'd be more forthcoming to speak. Well, let's let's define it first. What what are the, What is the it that, the, that you're asking me about that they see? It's hard for me to describe it without then get some impression of it. But say the Tic Tacs, the spheres with cubes in them, these objects that weren't planes, that weren't from our military, as far as we know, mm -hmm. that operate in such a way that we have no clue that the, and seems like it's some projection because it breaks conservation of momentum, stays still, disappears. So you define that and there as something that portrays exceptional or unexplainable mm. flight characteristics. That is observed, but that's not necessarily the average observation. Right? You don't look out, see it, and that darts away. A lot of times what people are seeing, pilots are seeing right now, are objects that are um, flying in non-symmetrical patterns, right? So not just flying in a straight line, but performing turns and hooks or seemingly descending from one altitude to another to perform some type of pattern, whether it's holding or not. Uh, and these are aircraft that are located at uh, basically the top of commercial air traffic altitudes, and they're seeing these objects 10 or 15,000 feet. You're just estimating above them. So we don't know if they're Tic Tacs or warped or this, that, the other thing, but the what has been seen, at least on a regular basis happening right now, are essentially lights that are up these aircraft and hold, executing, I'm going to just call it a holding pattern, but you know, circular patterns or uh, are flying in kind of J-books or, or uh, non-symmetrical patterns at altitudes that we wouldn't expect aircraft to be at. Uh, we would also expect uh, aircraft to not perform that well. So to have like tight turns and call it 70,000 feet, air is very thin there. So, you know, you take a even if a fighter jet is up at those altitudes, it's it's going to be taking very, you know, long turns, things of that nature. Uh, those are flight characteristics that we're really just not sure what they are, and the pilots don't know either. Uh, a lot, at, you know, they're reaching out to me, and I'll be airing more on this podcast, pilots that we interview. There's no shortage of them, because they're all seeing stuff up there right now. This is, you know, at least this has been communicated to me. There, you know, there's a lot of talk in the, in the cockpits uh, across the country on this on this area that a lot of them see it sending pictures and things of that nature of course uh you know lights against the black drop only tell you so much but um it's very clear from the videos that i am seeing that their crew you know are confused of what they're seeing these are you know professional aviators that are flying around you know 737s your other you know large aircraft commercial aircraft you can hear the, they're these things are you know Sticking out to them, they they will see satellites and shooting stars. You know, every time they go to work, essentially at night, uh, and so they are seeing a distinct change in the behaviors they're seeing. It. Uh, this is this is why I've been speaking out about our need to have better reporting in this area because these pilots don't even still don't feel comfortable talking about this. And um, on this podcast, we've spoken with pilots who have said how. They uh, specifically have talked to pilots who have seen the same thing they have airborne, but those pilots specifically did not reach out to the FAA controller over the radar to confirm those sightings because they didn't want that to be reported. They they were too fearful to have their call sign and their voice on seeing something like that. Uh, so I'll push back on your statement earlier where, you know, whether you call it stigma or something else, at least some of that aren't particular professionals. They, they do experience... Uh, a stigma because of there are, there can be uh, professional repercussions uh, for engaging on the topic. And so another thing too, so you know I haven't been hearing at least what's been happening right now descriptions of tic tacs things of that nature. Get they look like lights or, or sources of lights uh, without that much uh, three dimensionality to it, at least at high altitudes. Uh, there have been other cases outside of pilots where people are doing independent research where they're seeing things at much lower altitudes. 
uh, to various beans, uh, you know, over the market type uh, detection capabilities, active radars. Over the market? Or over the counter type, you know, technologies, not military grade, but just like, you know, uh, stuff that you could buy and experiment with on your own. You know, I have here reports of objects being seen, you know, sub 2,000 feet that do have a bit more three dimensionality to them. Uh, we can kind of make a warmer shape. Uh, we'll be working on that out in one to work for it. Sure, sure, sure. We'll be having a conversation sure. on this podcast about some of those data sets as well in the near future. Uh, and we're see we're hearing those reports, uh, at least the high altitude ones from pilots that work all across the globe, you know, from Europe, uh, Eastern Asia, and of course, the United States as well, uh, East Coast and West. Is there a difference in the between the commercial and the military in terms of what they witness? Pilots are in terms of what they witnessed, in terms of their reporting procedure, and in terms of their willingness to come forward. Is there a difference between those two? Yes, uh, I'll probably have you take me through each one. I'll just say on the the, the reporting willingness. Uh, I think that now today there is a greater degree of reporting within certain military circles, such as the Navy. I can't say whether the Air Force has uh, complied with the reporting to the same degree that the Navy has. Uh, we just don't have that at all in the commercial world. So, uh, within the regulation for commercial aviation, there is a just a very small couple sentences that essentially state uh, if you if you would like to report a UFO, you can report it to one of these several public source kind of data sets. Uh, so they kind of scatter the data to multiple non-government agencies. So really there's no reporting or tracking that's required. Uh, and we're seeing that now in the Navy and the military, but again, zero in the commercial world. Uh, that's, you know, one of the uh, efforts that we have at the uh, AIAA uh, in order to, uh, specify different reporting procedures and recommend them to the proper authorities so that uh, pilots do have need to safely means to safely record uh, these incidents without fear of repercussion in the order for a problem with their next yearly physical or anything of that nature and there's systems in place to do that that's just the nasa asrs and other systems that pilots trust for reporting safety issues we've already learned that lesson that if you just ignore issues or if you penalize pilot for talking about something well this what happens right they don't talk about it. And anytime it's a safety related issue, you have to talk about it to get that information out there to ensure this not in itself. Did anything happen to you after you came forward on Rogan and Lex? Meaning, were you talked to say, hey, please stop talking about this or we'll try to reprimand you in some way? No. No, I didn't know who would do that. You know, but there's no shadowy group that have warned me or otherwise influences my communication in any way. When there was the sphere and then the cube inside the sphere, shoe inside the sphere, not cube inside. <laughs> Did you see it with your eyes or you were teammates in the squad? I don't know what it's called. Squad, squad. I don't know the term. Okay. Squad, squadron. Right. Yep. Squad drop. Squadron. Yes. Squadron. Yay. Okay. Listen, they're not called squad. No. Okay. It My works. mother has been calling it a squad ever since I joined the Navy. All right. So your fellow members. Squadron mates. <laughs> All right. Great. <laughs> did they, did you see it or did they see it? I, with your eyes. Yeah. I never physically saw it on my eyeballs. Uh, we would see it on our sensors. Uh, we would see it on uh, the FLIR. And I just interviewed another uh, pilot from VFA 11 that was out there same time as me. And, uh, that'll probably air just before this. He had the same issue, you know, you would see on the sensors and the FLIR, but couldn't see it with his eyeballs. What do you make of it? Uh, you know, I hear people say, well, it's cloaking, right? You know, I, I'm not willing to jump on onto that topic or this yet. There are reasons, I have reasons to believe that there's still something physical there, whether we can see it or not based off the IR energy that would be picked up at that very specific location, as well as the radar returns. And after we turn around, you know, it would still be there. Uh, but I don't know what to make of it necessarily to the fact that we couldn't see it. We would still have to respect them as physical objects, having them on the FLIR. Uh, yeah, that was a big one. And a lot of people were like that. They would, you know, when I asked around, have you physically seen one? Most people were like, well, no, I, I, I 
you know, see it everywhere and I come to the merge, but I couldn't see it for whatever reason. But some people did. Um, some people did see it. Can so you give me an indication as to the distance between, I recall one of those stories, there was a, a pilot coming in and I was going out and it appeared that they saw, or at least one of them saw it with their eyes. What was the distance between the two ships? Yeah, so the two ships were actually going the same direction. Uh, they weren't going in and out. Uh, they were going, they were both going in at the in altitude for the areas. Okay. And about a thousand feet below that's kind of like the exit altitude, right? So you hit that piece of the sky at a certain altitude, okay. right? And that's entrance to the areas and the exits are below, right? So they were both going in at the entrance. They were about 100 feet apart or so uh, at that point as they enter up. And the object, I believe, was stationary. I don't think it like zipped between them. I think it was stationary at that point and they flew in between it. And so the aircrafts were moving, and that the, that object was more or less stationary at that point. Uh, the lead aircraft, you know, the lead aircraft pilot, who is really the only one with any agency to like look around, because the the dash to the wingman is staring directly at uh, the lead aircraft to fly formation off of him. Uh, so he can't like look around. He's focused in super tight. Uh, but the lead aircraft looked around. The lead aircraft pilot saw the object go down his right wing line in between the, his wingman and himself bit closer to him than his wingman. His wingman was on the right? Correct. Uh, now I don't know that 100% that he was on the right, but uh, in this story, it wasn't on the right. It, sure. it doesn't really matter, but yeah. I don't have that piece of But it doesn't change anything. So, but anyways, so in this story, he, the wingman is on the right, and wingman, we, an object goes between them, slightly closer to the lead than dash two. And that's one of the rare times that there's like a uh, reference to estimate a size of the object. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he loosely estimated to somewhere around five to 50 feet that he met you when he saw it. And that's, he described it as a cube that's on the clear spear. Did he, or anyone else who's seen a similar object that you know of, describe if the cube inside the spear was moving? No, haven't heard anything about that. As far as I understand, you have this upgraded system. Prior to end, you may uh, you can switch after it upgraded. Back to an old system. On the old system, you wouldn't see these objects, but on the new system, you would. Track right? Yes. Now, are you your intuition? Obviously, you can't give a definitive answer. But is your intuition that perhaps they were there this entire time, or at least for brief look for every rouse? It's just that we were we didn't have the capabilities to pick them up. Or do you think that for some reason it correlated with as soon as we got the new one there? It's yeah. Like My assumption is that they were there before and that the greater capability of the radar made them more apparent. And there's some anecdotal data uh, on that topic, whereas some people I've spoken to have, you know, on this podcast that have had experience at East Coast, they were having them before that radar was even available. And they weren't able to see the objects, but they were called out by the controllers to have them go check it out. And the controllers have a different set of instruments? They have like a ground-based radar that has different uh, frampels, I'll say. Uh, and our airborne ones, he didn't see the object he was told to go intercept. And uh, he didn't listen to the interview with uh, Mark Halsey. Uh, it was our, our second interview. Uh, but we'll, we'll put with something up on the page and people can check it out. Uh, but he, he didn't see anything as radar. He was, And this is a, a common procedure, especially for those radars, where he essentially had to zoom the radar in on a piece of sky, more or less. Uh, and that allowed him to see the object where he didn't have any radar contact before. And so that's an indication or example of a time where, although he didn't have radar uh, situational awareness to it, uh, he was able to kind of zoom in and then find the object. So that kind of leads us to believe that we're all there for longer than or before we got our radar up, right? Forgive me, I don't know the name of the systems that you use to detect, but I think you used to refer clear. Do they have a refresh rate? Is it like arc? So the FLIR is like a camera. It's a camera system. It's an IR, infrared, uh, heat energy, uh, optical system, and it can be switched to like a pure camera mode, like visible wavelength, upper you know, camera. Uh, and so for that, it's like any other camera. I'm sure there's a refresh rate built into it, but not a dense noticeable in any sense. Maybe you're thinking of the radar. Uh, so on the 73, there is kind of what's called like a B suite. It's a mechanically scanned array radar. So there's a sweeping with that. ESA radars operate digitally or 
differently. They're digitally scanned array radar, uh, which I'm not going to go into here, but uh, essentially uh, the refresh rate is much better. Oh, on the on the sweeping, the refresh rate is better. On the new oh, okay, okay. So when you see the object and it's making a, a shambling pattern, does it go full? Are you see that much like this? Then here, then here? No. You're it's actually continuous seeing... stream, continuous smooth analog. And, yeah, it's not skipping out of the radar. What is skipping is the target aspect in a creator, which if our radar contact just looks like a circle that's smoothly moving, that target aspect is an arrow that points in the direction he's moving to show where he's going more clearly, like mm -hmm. an arrow. And that will kind of like skip around more so. Normally that's smooth. So if it's an aircraft, that, that arrow kind of just moves smoothly. Uh, but for this, that arrow will kind of dart around. We didn't necessarily represent the direction it was going. In. So it seemed like it seemed the radar seemed to have a hard time picking up the directionality of the object. They see a seat. Even though it was actually showing it moving, it's that, you know, that particular subject just were I struggle. And that's how I would identify them on the radar, just looking out, seeing them, because they would kind of have that scattered appears to it where everything else was very smooth. So I had a higher confidence that that was one of those objects that just normal air traffic. Are you seeing them as blips or are you see it, uh, seeing an actual shape? Uh, so on the radar, was, everything is just a graphical display that doesn't represent reality. Like, a, you know, so an icon, you know, versus like, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, on the FLIR, we would see, I would see, you know, the IR source look like a, like someone was shining a flashlight on the FLIR. Uh, so one seeing like a three dimensional object. Uh, that makes sense. You know, uh, like this is a common experience. This isn't just yours. Like other people similarly see it as, the, as if it's flashing to them, even if they're in a different area. Not flashing, but like so a flash light. Flash like, yeah. Yeah. Was, yes. Uh, I, I don't know, right? Anecdotally, you asked us, these are just questions we weren't even considering at the time, you know, like getting into this much detail on it. Uh, but I, I just a couple anecdotal cases. Yes, that's how it's been described in the other field. For your podcast, are you getting people who are on your squad, your squadron to come on? Yep. Uh, I don't want to give away any names right now, but we do have some pilots that were, you know, some squadron mates of mine at the time uh, that will be talking about their experiences with these objects for the first time publicly. When you experience them, do you tell your higher ups about them? Our higher up of the squadron is essentially our commanding officer who you know, more or less the, the mum or dad of the squadron, essentially. So they're kind of involved in the day-to-day -day conversation. So they're very well aware of it. Now, what they communicate out of the squadron of his unit command is really where, you know, I don't necessarily have visibility into that, but that would be the more important communication that you're referring to and up the chain. And I know it did get passed up the chain to a certain degree, but then it just kind of went nowhere because there was nowhere for it to go, essentially. Are you sure what nowhere? Or well, I'm not sure. That's an no. assumption, right? From our perspective in the squadron, you know, we set, we, we passed it up and that was that. But where it actually ended up from our perspective. Meaning that nothing changed, you weren't followed up with. Correct. And so eventually we almost had a deer mid-air with one of these objects, which required a safety report to be filed. Uh, and so we filed a uh, hazard report uh, on that near mid-air. And that's, you know, from the incident where it described as a sphered Q or excuse me, Cuban sphere. Uh, and that was, that was another way it was passed up the chain in the sense, although those reports aren't really like looked into hard and then like glop, it's more of just like data tracking mechanism than a proactive safety, you know, prevention mechanism. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, bulletins do go out. So people are getting some general awareness. So it's better than nothing. So I'm just imagining I'm the commanding officer. If I hear my people are encountering some objects, I would think. Perhaps that's some debris, but also it could be an adversary. We need to proactively go and check that out once more or twice more. Does that happen? Are, are, there, are there missions specifically tied to the fight of this? No, but there are opportunities to do so, I would say. Uh, well, I'll say this. In our, during the time period off the East Coast, there wasn't. That's the only time period I can really speak to. Um, and we were not launching on any type of mission to go investigate these. We were just trying to stay away from them as much as possible, essentially, so we could get our job done. And what that looked like sometimes was us having to cancel an event or to remove an event because that area had objects in it and we would have interfered with our training. Uh, or even halfway through our training, the objects kind of 
would come into our area, and so we'd have to knock off the training somewhere else. Did you find it odd that you weren't, or that other people weren't sent to go and look at them and identify them? Did it seem odd to us that there wasn't someone for that? I think maybe it was would have been nice, but yeah, I mean, we we were just so caught with trying to do what we needed to do in such a busy time that we didn't really put any, you know, real thinking into pragmatic or proactive solutions. You know, it was just, hey, we're going to do a flight, and if this is a debrief point for us to talk about, that's where it ended. Right. Not to say that's the best answer, but that's what it was like. Yeah, yeah. Remember how we talked about the absence of evidence? To me, this is one of the... Why... Again, if I was, but I don't know anything, not an awesome. We're the podcaster. <laughs> so if I was a commanding officer, I was helping, look, these people, we encountered this at least twice. Like, even at the second, the first time, it most likely both of us, certainly the second. So why do you think it is that there isn't some protocol, or maybe the commanding officer has leeway and doesn't require the protocol? Why do you think it is that, in your case, as far as you know, unless you know about the she's really actively sent out to go investigate, what the heck? It's like, why doesn't that happen more often? Especially if it's recurring. Like, and you have to cancel something because of it. And her commits it serious. Well, uh, I think part of it is that I don't think we really have the tools, perhaps, in a lot of cases. Um, so I know people have kind of half jokingly said, hey, if we can't go do our event, we'll go try to check out one of these UAP things and have done it and have seen it as a Cuban sphere, you know. Uh, but the tactical jet is not a good tool to scientifically determine what these are. Our tools are made for very specific tasks. So other than just like physically trying to slow down, we can't even, we can only slow down so much, right? So at best we're getting like 100, 120 knot pass on this object that's potentially stationary. Is it buy it for a you know, split second, and that's our data gathering. I mean, we can lock it up with our radar from do, and, you know, every, almost the way the radars work, you know, you don't even have to really point it at something per se. So, you know, these things are likely getting pinged by radars all the time. Uh, so you'd need, you know, your own tool set. You'd need to, you know, understand exactly what you're looking for, to perhaps modify current sensors to be able to, uh, you know, look for the signal that these are putting out. Uh, and you get you need buddy to do that. You need a team, and you need equipment to carry those sensors up there. These are all things I think that are very cheap little uh, solutions. But we just haven't been looking at this problem, but we haven't taken it very seriously. And it's taken a lot of work to even get where we are today. But what well, where we are today is with the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, with NASA's Independent Study Team, with the AIAA UAP IOC group. Uh, we see these organizations standing up that can bring that type of investigatory power to this. It's just taken longer, I think, than we all would have liked, but we're, we're seeing that kind of whole government approach now, I think, start to stand out. The absence of a protocol for what to do when you encounter one of these, or at least the current absence of what? Does that indicate anything to you? There's not a current absence right now. There is a standardized reporting procedure in the Navy right now. The Air Force has spoken about a standardized procedure, uh, in the past, although they're not very public with what they're executing on today. Uh, so I don't necessarily see it as a, uh, a, a gap at the moment. I see, you know, the whole previous, you know, generation of conversation around this as a potential gap, but, you know, at least starting with the UAP task force report and the report from the Navy and well, 144 cases or so, we are starting to, uh, go down that, uh, so I agree with you before that, but now we seem to be in a slightly different paradigm, or I won't even say slightly, just a different paradigm as far as openness and communication on this topic. Now, since what year? What year was that? The oh, uh, well, we had our first, we had the UAP task force report, and what they did was they reported on the the UAP reporting that was undertaken by the Navy, and technically the reporting period for for that was 2004 to I think 2020 or 2019. But about 80% of those cases, if not more, were from the very recent past since the Navy started recording these objects. So you have, you know, about 2018 to 2020, and then you have a probably a case in 2004, most likely the Tic Tac, and, 
if there's cases in between that reporting start and the Tic Tac, I'm mm -hmm. unaware of them if they're part of the report. And so you see, you know, uh, a, a number, call it a hundred perhaps, or just in the past couple of years, uh, unexplainable UAP from that deep reporting system. Why all of a sudden do they have this task force? I think it's, you know, I think it's a lot of what it looks like from outside, which is, you know, there's been enough screaming to claw and yelling from the people with jets to say, hey, this is a safety problem and that someone needs to pay attention. Not only is it a safety problem, but, you know, you zoom out and we see very clearly that this could be a national security concern as well, not just from uh, what we call uh, ELID or electronic intelligence, things of that nature, where people could be uh, observing our tactics and our missions for the jets on the East Coast. But even with this, you know, Chinese balloon that's, you know, meandered across the country recently, we see, you know, how susceptible we could be to these things and why we can't just have uncertainty in our airspace. So it's very simple. If this is a, you know, if we think this is a foreign drone, then we need to treat this as a national security threat, or at least something we need to look into from that perspective. And if it's anything else, then we just need to treat this as a scientific issue and be curious about it. In other words, it was bound to happen at some point. It's just... And just happen to happen at 2020. We're getting we're seeing or more. We have better data. We have data, and data links, and so gathering data in a sense now is almost trivial. We're always gathering data, and so you know eventually it's just hard to more of the issue. And so are we seeing them? Okay, are the pilots reporting it more now with ever increasing frequency because they have increased radar, or or do you surmise or you have some reason to believe? I think conjecture that they're appearing more recently. I have and again anecdotal indications that it does seem to be increasing. It's not just that we're able to pick up on them more. They're appear. I think it's both. Probably. I mean, I'm intuiting that it's both, but uh, I do think that uh, I do 100 confident it's due to more reporting and better sensors. But I think there is an aspect where it seems to be happening more. I don't know. You know. Maybe that's twenty percent of the overall. Maybe it's thirty. Maybe it's five. But it does seem to be a small part of it. At least that's how I intuit it. I see it. And that's a true story. How does this whole topic make you feel? Well, you know, it can be an exhausting topic, uh, as I'm sure you're aware with the existential nature of the topics that you deal with. Uh, this is very much, you know, like you said, ride on a roller coaster sometimes. You're not sure how, how secure the uh, tracks are nailed down in a sense. Uh, but it's like anything else that I've done in my life. It's just an execution of discipline, you know. And I think anyone can really explore this topic without fear of embarrassment or, you know, the laughter. If they just be disciplined in their thoughts and they just treat it as, you know, a thought experiment to consider what that would be, to accept an assumption for a little while and explore what that world looks like when then. Uh, a lot of times we don't seem, seem to have the courage to make those kind of small leaps because they're too far outside of the median and bar, our social culture. But I think we're making progress, you know. There's been a latent interest in this topic and more we talk about it and the more people see that we treat in a serious manner, the more people are going to want to join that conversation. Do you know anyone who claims to end up ducked? No. Apparently in the gimbal video, after the video cuts off, the gimbal or the object in the video did maneuver, did something. Do you know about that? What did it do? Uh, I'll just say that the, uh, the rocking behavior seemed to intensify. Um, uh, we see, you know, some movement. Uh, we, see, yeah, there was continued unstable kind of rocking movement in a sense. Uh, that's that's all I'll say on that front. And all, that's all you'll say because it's all you can sing, or that's all legally that you can sing. I have no legal. I have no legal constraints. So I've never signed an NDA. This was never a classified topics uh, or anything like that. You know, these have always just been my experiences, but. Uh, I think we should wait till the, the air crew themselves have the opportunity to explain what they saw so I don't speak for them. Have you experienced any other phenomenon since the sighty? And I say sighty need quotations because your eyes and see it with the radar. But... Sure. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, not like, you know, I don't like see U, 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 UFO or UAP on any regular basis or anything like that or, uh, or some hitchhiker effect that you've heard. 
Yeah, I, you know, I'm loosely familiar with that concept. Uh, I'll say I have no quantitative data to say that. I have had the experiences. But quantitative data seems to be lacking in all respects. <laughs> so up the fellow pilots, especially those that are in proximity to it, do you find that they have experienced something afterward, whether it's an increase in the frequency of the sightings of them or something that has fallen? I'm not be able to answer that question. Uh, those are conversations we've had. You remember, this is uh, still the stigmatized topic and there's still a threat of, you know, professional risk and, and things of that nature, even losing a medical license things of that nature. So people are still very much not comfortable about talking about this. And a lot of the pilots I have been speaking to are either close to retirement or have got out of the military. Uh, so triple that for, you know, medical sensitivity is thing that nature. Pilots are the last group that hopefully talks about, you know, and uh, health problems they have because they're terrified of losing their source of income and their job for, you know, aging or what have you. What's your opinion on Baldwin, sir? Um, uh, I've, you know, I've said before, I, I would like to believe what he had to say. And there's some, you know, there's some interesting parts of his story that, uh, I think require validation. Hopefully we can do that one day, but you know, this is a topic that has so much like cultural baggage and history to it that, uh, I don't really trust anyone in a sense, right? I I'm eager for the opportunity to validate people's experiences. I look forward to opportunities to do so. What's the most compelling UFO sighting story that you've been told? I, that I've been told, I'd have to say Fravers. Um, that one's a truly compelling. Uh, and I think most people listening to this are going to be familiar with that one. Um, the David Fravers story, which is very detailed and involved multiple sensors over the course of multiple things, uh, military grade equipment, things of that nature. So that's very compelling to me. And, um, and but I have a special place in my heart received for these stories that involve children in schools, you know, if the, there's a case in Zimbabwe. And these are, these are, you know, obviously on the other end of the spectrum, right? There's no military grade sensors or putting in or data lakes or evidence, but the house, children like that telling the story in such a manner, all in the same ways, incredibly even telling powerful, I think. And, you know, Again, a purely subjective, but I think those are just so, so compelling. It was great speaking with you, man. We could, fantastic speaking with you. I want to plug something, by the way. Please. Well, there's several of them want to be plugged then. So I'll plug something that's not mine. Earlier, we spoke about how, Carl's, you, how, how Carl Jung views UFOs and it has to do with transcendence, meeting, spiritual growth, and so on. So the work of Diana Pasolka, this is why her work is so important, because she sees the UFO phenomenon where the studies it through a religious lens. Not to say that UFOs are not to state not to say that the study of UFOs is like a religion of a sort. It's more nuanced than that. So I just wanted to pluck her work. I think you should speak with her. I've spoken with her on the on I've spoken with her on the Toe podcast. So Certainly, we'd love to get her on some time. And I appreciate you taking a trip up here in New England to be on this. Uh, I know your podcast you do from your house or from your home office, but um, so fiction. Yeah, you know, that home kitchen. Well, thanks for making the trip out to New Hampshire. Yeah, well, your set is fantastic. People can't see behind, but it's it's wonderful. Thank you. All right. Anything else? No, I think that's it. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. We're not, I'm not sure where this is airing this part, but thanks for coming on the Toe Podcast. And if not there, then. Thank you for allowing me to, thank you for inviting me out to the Birch podcast. You're good. Uh, for those watching, thank you for watching the Birch podcast and be sure to subscribe below. Thank you.